Did you know that North Carolina was known for its production of pitch and turpentine, both of which were used in shipbuilding? And that's how the state got its nickname, the Tar Heel State. Welcome to the Lore of the South. Welcome back to Laura of the South with me, Kelly Cruz. How the heck are you? How was y'all's holiday weekend? Did any of y'all get to see the meteor storm last week? Scientists were estimating a thousand meteors per hour, which upgraded it from a shower to a storm. The last time it was visible here was in 1995, and I got to see it that time, along with my cousin Chad out in my Grandma Dickens' backyard in Fort Worth. This time, however, I had to work the next morning and the weather wasn't cooperating, so I wasn't so lucky. But if y'all caught any of it, please share it on our Facebook page. I'd love to see what you captured. And today in History Making News, this story coming to us from Britannica. It's the 55th anniversary of the Loving vs. Virginia case where the U.S. Supreme Court struck down a Virginia law that forbid interracial couples from marrying. In my opinion, this was another case of just pure racism with a side of mind your business. Who cares who marries who? Mind your business and nobody gets hurt, am I right? Also, there's a movie about this called Loving. It's available on streaming platforms. And there's also a documentary about it on HBO Max, I believe. I'll leave it up to y'all to Google search for it if you're interested. So, on with episode 46, Where Oh Where Has Nell Gone? This story was suggested by listener Belle, a mystery from her hometown, and this episode comes with a warning. There's a lot of talk about suicide, abuse, and murder. I don't go into gory details, but I do know that these are touchy subjects, so be forewarned. There's an old Victorian-style house located on Riverside Drive in Elizabethtown, North Carolina, where passerby see lights turn on and off on their own accord, even when there is no one at home. Some have even seen a pretty young woman peering from an upper floor window, wearing a high-necked blouse. Current and past inhabitants of the old home have reported late-night footsteps, doors opening and closing by themselves, and a pale woman who has been spotted wandering the hallways. She has also appeared at the foot of the bed in what was once her own room. Who is this lost soul? It's thought to be that of young and beautiful Neil Cropsey, who disappeared on a cold night, November 20th, 1901. Nell was born Ella Maud Cropsey, in Brooklyn, New York, July of 1882, to parents William and Mary. A younger sister joined the family a couple of years later and cutely nicknamed Ollie. The family moved to Elizabeth City, North Carolina in 1898, taking up residence in the Victorian mansion. Mr. Cropsey then became the justice of Pasquatonk County, and Nell and Ollie soon became its sweethearts. Both girls were being courted by upstanding young men of the county. Ollie's young man's name was Roy Crawford, and Nell was being courted by the sheriff's son, Jim Wilcox. It was rumored that after about two years or so, Jim and Nell's relationship had began to sour. The pair were often caught mid-argument when seen out and about in Elizabeth City. It was on the night of November 20th that all of this came to a head. Ollie and Nell were entertaining their young men and a cousin visiting from New York. Jim had come to the gathering with the intentions of ending things with Nell. After months of arguing, he was done with the constant bickering. He had even brought with him the two personal items that Nell had gifted him with, so that he may return them to her in a way that would finalize the breakup. Upon entering the Cropsey home, He deposited the parasol into the family's umbrella stand, and he also carried a photo of Nell in his breast pocket, which for the time being he held on to. As the night was coming to a close, Jim invited Nell out onto the porch. 
The cousin went up to bed, and Ollie was bidding her own young man good night. Jim will later report that Nell went out onto the porch without her coat or a hat, and it was bitterly cold outside. He was telling her good night at about 11 p.m. He spoke with Nell for about 10 minutes, giving her the bad news of no longer wishing to court her, and in the end he handed Nell her photo and turned and walked back to his own home, leaving Nell in tears. Nell wasn't seen again for 37 days. She had seemingly disappeared, and it's here that the stories begin to diverge. Ollie and her father become adamant that Jim Wilcox had to be the one responsible for Nell's disappearance. Nell's own mother, Mary, at first said maybe Nell had eloped with some stranger. The brother, who I've only read about one mention of, never spoke a word about the subject. William Cropsey contacts the chief of police and has Wilcox brought back to the Cropsey home where he was interrogated for three hours. Jim told them the same story again and again. He left Nell on the porch at 11. He stopped and spoke to a friend on the way home, and he was even seen entering his house at midnight. He also told about an odd conversation that Nell had started amongst the group who had gathered at the Cropsey house the night of her disappearance. She asked the group what they thought the best choice of suicide would be. Her choice had been to freeze to death. Was she giving a warning of plans she had? It was freezing out. Or was it just a dramatic conversation amongst teenagers? With no body or evidence of murder, Jim Wilcox was released. William and Olive continued to rile the citizens of Elizabethtown, calling Jim a vile-tempered murderer at every turn, never missing an opportunity to remind everyone of how Jim would be seen yelling at dear Nell even in public. 37 days after Nell's disappearance on December 27th, her body was found in perfect condition floating in the Pasquatonk River, which had been thoroughly searched at the time of her disappearance and Jim's fate was sealed. He was again arrested, this time surrounded by lynch mobs who swore their own brand of justice of Jim Wilcox didn't legally swing. He was found guilty of first-degree murder in March of 1902 and was sentenced to hang. But luckily for Jim, a mistrial was declared by the North Carolina Supreme Court just before the sentence could be carried out. He was retried in 1903, this time found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to 30 years in prison. After serving about half his term in 1918, Governor Thomas Bickett paid call to Jim in prison. Jim was granted a full pardon. The last person to see Jim alive was a writer. It seems that Jim was wanting to tell his side of the story for all to hear, or maybe not because Jim Wilcox, soon after the interview, decided to take his own life via shotgun blast to the head. The writer, too, died soon after that meeting in a fiery car crash, and it will never be known what Jim had told him. Roy, Ollie's old beau, unalived himself via gunshot in 1908, nine years before Jim's release. Nell and Ollie's younger brother, Will, also committed suicide using poison in 1913. Did they know something and couldn't handle the guilt? What did happen to Nell? There were rumors about town that Nell might have been involved with a married man, a well-to-do older neighbor of the family. If it had become a known fact, it would have caused a huge scandal for the family. And then there's also the condition of Nell's body, one found floating in the river. I'm sure y'all have watched some forensic files type shows, and the water is not a friend to the human body, especially if the temps are above freezing. So why was Nell in perfect condition when she was found five weeks after her disappearance? Was she killed that night, body hidden in the cold and later dumped in the river? 
did she freeze to death and then somehow her body slid into the river later? Did her brother have something to do with it? Knowing after the breakup with Wilcox, which provided a great cover for this scandalous relationship that Nell might have been carrying on, the breakup would end that cover and Nell would bring a heavy burden of shame down on the family. Kinda sounds like motive to me. And with the way that Ollie and William were running around town bashing Jim Wilcox, they could have been trying to cover for young Will. And what became of the rest of Nell's family? Well, Ollie became a recluse, only coming out in public after Jim's suicide to once again declare him her sister's murderer. William Cropsey went from successful farmer and county justice to a withered old man who sold vegetables by the roadside. I couldn't find any mention of Mary Cropsey, so I'm not sure what became to her after the loss of two children. But 120 years later, this crime remains unsolved. We'll probably never know the whole truth, but we can do a whole lot of speculating. Heck, it may not even be Nell's ghost haunting the old Cropsey house. It might be that of her recluse sister, Olive. Maybe she's got a guilty conscience. Side notes. I got most of my info from two sources. One of which was full on condemning Jim Wilcox. The other swears he went to the grave being wrongfully accused. You can find the websites in my show notes. Also, this is just some insight on how my brain works. Um, I've told y'all before I got Jeopardy brain. I cannot say necropsy without thinking necropsy or necropsy, an animal autopsy. Lord help me. Anyways, should we do a recommendation this week? I haven't done one in a while. Let's do, we need to talk about ghosts and The Dark Paranormal, both hosted by Kevin Eustace from Liverpool. We Need to Talk About Ghosts is more, shall we say, the lighthearted of the two. Kevin isn't afraid to laugh at himself or crack a joke where, or crack a joke where warranted. The Dark Paranormal is much more serious podcast about what the show suggests, the dark side of the paranormal. Give those a listen, and if you like them, tell Kevin that Kelly from Lore of the South sent you. Follow us on all the social medias, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. And y'all, we went and did it. We started a Patreon. Um, We did so with the hopes of being able to buy some better equipment and buying equipment that will allow us to do interviews. Because right now, uh, we only have the available to do one recording at a time. There's a lot of benefits to supporting us on the Patreon. So go check it out. You can search for it by using The Lore of the South. Or you can find a link in our show notes. And you can check out what your benefits could be if you decided to subscribe to the Patreon. And you know, you could always just do it for one month and throw five bucks at the show. It would be a great help anything that y'all could do also we've had a couple of contacts people given show ideas and i have really appreciated hearing from y'all so if you also have an idea or just want to say hello you can email the show at lordthesouth at gmail.com and with that we'll talk to y'all later on lord of the south